Welcome everyone to the Brooklyn Rails 189th New Social Environment, if you can believe that. Um, Mackenzie, we were, on, we were on together in March and it was like just the beginning and I don't think that anyone thought that we would still be here in December. And here we are. Um, I'm JC, I manage the social media here at The Rail and I am really excited to be your MC today for a conversation between Isabel Sandoval Rosa Daniel Lang Levitsky and Mackenzie Work. We're also super lucky to have the poet Drew Pham here who will read to close today's program. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny and Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. I want to highlight that the state of New York is currently engaged in a baseless lawsuit against the Shinnecock Nation. And I'm gonna drop a link in the chat if you wanna learn more about that um, and contribute to their cause. The Brooklyn Rail also acknowledges the illegal annexation of the Republic of Artsakh as a grave international injustice. We stand in support of the Armenian people and the global Armenian diaspora. Finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Tony McDade, Nina Pop, David McGatty, James Skurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmad Arbery, Rayshard Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toyin Salau, Walter Wallace Jr., Casey Goodson, and countless others. We have lost white supremacy and police violence in this country. Um, it's sort of heartbreaking. We don't keep like a real, it, it is heartbreaking. We don't keep like a real, comprehensive list, obviously, but as the months have gone on, um, the list of names has continued to lengthen. Um, we acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our host, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's host. Mackenzie Work is the author, among other things, of Reverse Cowgirl, which was out with Semiotex in 2019, and Capital is Dead, out with Verso, also in 2019. She teaches at the New School. Mackenzie, over to you. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be here again. I think this is the third time I've, I've done an event for uh, Brooklyn Rail. And first of all, my, my thanks to the team and the kind of extraordinary professionalism of, uh, how you guys have figured out how to, to run these things. I, I really deeply appreciate that. Uh, so today's uh, event is about trans femme aesthetics. Uh, it's the second of two events I've done under that uh, heading, first with uh, Gender and Sexuality Studies Institute at the New School and this one with the Brooklyn Rail. And there are events in advance of a special issue of EFLUX Journal that I'm uh, editing slash curating. Uh, that's going to come out next um, spring, I think, not entirely sure when. Uh, and both uh, Isabel and Rosa are uh, contributors to that, who owe me drafts. <laughs> my, my Brooklyn Rail editors will know, will know this mood, right? Um, but there are also people whose work, um, very different kinds of work, I really kind of deeply admire. And I want to say just uh, a little bit about that. I really dislike those long introductions of everybody because as somebody who's been introduced in these things, I always kind of squirm with embarrassment. So this, this is just like the, the top note of uh, why I think these people are amazing. So Rosa Daniel Langlevitsky is a cultural worker and organizer associated with Glitter House. Is currently working on a project recovering trans women's political writing since the 70s and her writings you can find in uh, many places uh, with a little bit of google searching. Uh, Isabel Sandoval is a New York based Filipina filmmaker uh, who made uh, Senorita an apparition uh, and the, the one I recommend you really put in your Netflix uh, queue immediately is uh, Lingua Franca uh, it's available in the United States on uh, Netflix. Uh, Isabel, is it available in other territories? Um, Canada and, and France. Sorry that, that uh, 
intellectual property colonial regimes stop you stop us seeing things but filmmakers got to get paid you know there's a whole tension in that right yeah. uh all right so uh that's our panelists um and uh, it's going to be a kind of informal chat and um the first thing i wanted to ask is really if Rosa and then Isabel, can you say a little bit about, you know, if I say trans femme aesthetics, how do you sort of come at that personally? Like, how do you feel like that connects to your life? So, hmm. I guess one way to, um, a thing that I think is probably pretty central to how I think about most things trans um, is, and many things femme, um, is that my experience for the last 20 odd years has been being more or less stationary and seeing terminology and terminology and subculture move around me and put me into a lot of different categories. Um, and watching the different, um, the different kinds of labels and accesses to labels and the spaces that go with them move around is, is a lot of what what always feels important um, to me in um, in my experience, because um, because part of what's come along with that experience has been a a very physical sense of the. Um, the deliberate construction of those spaces and the, the different political and cultural projects that all of these things have. So, so to me, it's hard to think about um, femme or trans or aesthetics for that matter, um, without having in my head the three or four different cycles of battles over terminology that I've seen since all thought transgender in the mid nineties. Um, and the, the, the different kinds of, of welcomes and unwelcomes that I've experienced in trans spaces, in dyke spaces, in queer spaces, and so on. Um, so finding myself in this interesting spot right now where, um, where in some kinds of contexts, I can get taken seriously as a transsexual, and in some kinds of contexts, I can get taken seriously as a femme dyke. And in some kinds of contexts, I can't get taken seriously as either, um, is a lot of what what goes on for me and personally in thinking about all this. And Mackenzie, you're getting that uh, on, on there right right from the start of, of how you know these things kind of like uh, are always in motion, and there's always kind of also tensions and struggles around these languages, and and you know uh, uh, we have some agency in making that, but also not. Um, yeah, Isabel, how how does yeah trans femme aesthetic? What is how does that seem to connect to you? Um, for me, the idea or concept of the trans femme aesthetics is really an amorphous one. It's not fixed or constant for me. I transitioned about five years ago and I've made my first two features prior to my transition. So Lingo Franca really is my first film after transition. And, you know, when you talk about, you know, being trans and femme, I feel like that's really just part and an aspect of who we are individually, because apart from that, I'm also an immigrant 
um, I'm an immigrant from the Philippines. So that makes me a person of color here in the US. And so what I tried to do by making Lingua Franca is to make it in a way that was really authentic to my sensibility as an artist and also to my experience as a trans woman of color living in America. I've said that it's not autobiographical, but it is deeply personal in that, you know, I am trying to access emotions, emotional experiences that I felt while transitioning and, you know, incorporating that in the character of Olivia that I played in the film. So for me, it's, you know, there, there's, it's not a monolithic or um, heterogeneous term. There's not one defining experience um, that encapsulates trans femme aesthetics. But what I tried to do in Lingua Franca is to show that in practice and the sensibility and the aesthetic vision that is apparent in my work is one specific expression of a trans femme aesthetic. And it comes from a place of, as I mentioned, authenticity. I really fought hard to make a film like this without any compromise. Um, and I purposely and pointedly came up with a premise that would seem kind of boilerplate for a lot of cisgender, you know, male filmmakers that they would take the story in a particular direction given its premise. And I tried to dodge those tropes and cliches as much as possible. And I think that's what makes it feel startlingly um, singular and unique for the film lovers and um, the audiences that vibed with the film. Yeah, it would be just so boring if there was a trans femme aesthetic, right? It would be just, wouldn't that be so awful? It would be like, you know, like some flavor of disco or something from 1972. Yeah, yeah so I, I, I never imagined there would be like, we'd all have the same answer to this. Even, even on different days, if I ask you tomorrow, you'd probably feel like a different way about it. Uh, but I gotta say one thing I love about uh, lingua franca is is I sort of have my own private like version of the Bechdel test for like trans stuff in in cinema and it's really simple is there more than one trans character in this case is there more than one trans woman uh, so yes there are uh, do they talk to each other and yes they do and do they talk about something other than being trans and yes they do you know there's other things going on in their world and as you point out it's also an immigrant story uh, and, and an undocumented story is part of it as yeah. well. Uh, so yeah, these, these things weave into the uh, rest of our lives and, and they're, you know, in, in the general sense, working class people, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Rosa, I, I wanted to, and I have the advantage of having read some things both of our panelists have read, so I'm gonna like dig into that a little bit. Um, but Rosa, I wanted to ask you about the class connection when we think about different kinds of uh, trans femme culture and, uh, you looked at ones other than the one that's in uh, Isabel's film, but maybe we could sort of table a, a few versions of how trans femme can be different if we think about it as a class and race experience. Yeah, so, hmm. I mean, I think the one piece of that to me is if we're, if we're using the word femme at all, we're talking about really and this is part of, this is sort of the starting point of of the efflux um the piece that i'm putting together for the efflux issue um we're talking about two source points one is working class dyke bar culture um which was very was very particularly and really still is at least if you are in the circles um in the circles and spaces that um that i moved through quite distinct from from whatever version of middle class upper class respectable um lesbian life um 
exists in parallel with it. And, and also very complicatedly split on racial lines. Um, in, in my experience, less so than gay male spaces, um, but I don't know how limited that is to the world I've, that I've moved through. Um, and the other, and the other is the, the ballroom world. Um, so the space of, um, where specific Black and Latinx performance cultures are the anchor of subcultural countercultural spaces um, that have flourished since the late 60s in particular, but go back as do, do, does Butch Fem Dyke Bar culture, go back to the beginning of the 20th century at least. Um, so both of these spaces are spaces of poor and working class folks, spaces where a lot of the a lot of the femme zone has heavy overlap with sex work and a whole range of within that in the entire range of the sex trades, both historically and presently. Um, if especially if we're talking about whatever we want to put into the zone of trans femme. Um, so what I'm interested in in thinking about trans femme is the lineage, the aesthetic and cultural and political lineages that specifically think of themselves through, through the term femme because it is the term of those working class multiracial spaces. Um, and that is partly my desire to make an intervention on a lot of the current uses of trans femme, which gets used in a way that I think flattens a lot of what trans folks in motion away from manhood do. Mm -hmm. um, because femme historically is not normative femininity. It's not womanhood. It's another thing that's specifically articulated in these very class grounded ways um, in just the, in the same sense that we can say normative femininity is a class phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I guess, and, and you've you've pointed this out as well that there, there's a, a a femme you can be to signal to others who might be like you that you're available for support, and mutual self defence, and that's a little different to the femme that's about being undetectable. Although that may also be a kind of a safety strategy, but there might be different things at stake and different ways of thinking that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, everything about calling this trans femme aesthetics was problematic to me. And I was looking for people who'd unpick why, you know, any of these terms. Uh, uh, trans is not a word that's used everywhere in the United States, let alone the rest of the world by these communities we talk about. Femme isn't either. Uh, femme is a thing I'm at risk of appropriating. Uh, and then aesthetics, like what, it, what is that even? <laughs> so yeah, I, I kind of wanted to have those things on the table. But Isabel, I wanted to, to ask you how you perceive the, the difference and continuity between the sort of New York Filipina universes of, of transness and would that even be a, a term that would work in that context? Um, you know, when I was growing up, I was born in the 80s, so, so I grew up in the 90s. And back in the Philippines then, I think there wasn't really the concept of transness, I think, did not seriously emerge until about 10, 15 years ago. Um, and in the 80s and 90s, the individuals that were, we would consider today as trans were, cons were really considered by society as hyper-feminized um, gay 
gay people. And I think that's partly the reason, or primarily the reason why I did not realize until I moved to the US um, that I was trans was because I feel like there was one singular or predominant mode to be trans um, in the Philippines when I was growing up. And that was what was portrayed in you know, popular culture and media. And again, it's this very hyper feminized Barbie you know, type. And as they're um, depicted in film and TV, they're almost always caricatures or the butt of jokes and ridicule. And I was more of a bookish, you know, reserved kid and I had intellectual pretension. So it really was difficult for me to wrap my head around the fact that I might be trans. And it wasn't until after I moved here, maybe three years after I moved to the US and I came across on YouTube, different channels made by, you know, trans persons going through their transitions and they were documenting them as they were on HRT. And these were people from different backgrounds. There were writers, there were people who worked for nonprofits, there were people who um, were from our working class backgrounds. And I realized that I was asking myself the same questions that they were asking themselves. And I think it was at that moment that I realized that um, transitioning or being trans, being trans femme, like there's not just one way, you know, or one particular mode to be that way and that we can be trans any way we want to. Um, and, you know, when I was also growing up, my role models were women, but they were really headstrong, independent, defiant women. I mean, Madonna. <laughs> And then later on, Jane Fonda. And I think, interesting, the moment that I realized I wanted to transition and that I was sure with myself that I was trans was that it was not about transitioning to become a woman, but, it, it, but about transitioning to become more fully myself. Mm -hmm. And um, I, being a woman was just one facet of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, so there's so much here. There, there is a thing that's specific to uh, the, the visibly encounterable uh, trans cultures often are things like bar scenes. Uh, but yeah, what do, you, what do you do if you're kind of bookish and introverted? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, was, I was incredibly introverted and I, I am still incredibly introverted now. So like, I don't, I feel in a way left out because I'm not really actively part of any communities. I have friends, of course, I have you know trans friends, and but I feel like I thrive best, you know, artistically and you know emotionally just in my own space where I don't feel like I have to define myself rigidly as either a Filipino or you know an immigrant. And I, yeah, I, I'm the type that doesn't like to conform in any way. And um, as a matter of fact, like I'm working on a short film now that's commissioned by, by Mew, Mew, it's Mew Mew's Women's Tales. Um, and they previously invited the likes of Agnes Varda, um, Lucretia Martel, then Ramsey. And I had just, maybe he's like, hopefully he doesn't watch this, but I just parted ways with a cinematographer that I feel like is, you know, um, impeding my creativity um, and I want to experiment and take risks and be adventurous in my own art and I balk at any attempt to um, suppress or hmm. contain that in any way. Yeah Rosa can I can I ask you about this about Mia maybe there's a tension between what we need uh, politically, where I, where I feel like being able to sign onto something together is really key, like solidarity to me is the central principle. But, but as an artist, you always want to be like a little include me out about that. So how does one negotiate that tension? 
So, hmm. um, I think my friend and comrade Adelaide, who I think is here, would be entertained, will be entertained by this answer, because um, she knows part of where it's coming from. Um, both as an organizer and a cultural worker, I tend to think unity is overrated. <laughs> um, in when when we're when we're doing um, when we're doing work that's aimed at that's aimed at transformation, especially on on structural levels, the the kind of the kinds of coming together that seem to me from from my experience and and from what I've learned to be most useful and effective are when we're really clear about where we're at and we figure out how to how to work um, both with folks who we share that with and with folks who we don't and sim and I think similarly as a cultural worker I'm largely a theater person um, and that's not work that happens alone and it's and i i really felt what isabel was saying about the need the need to make active choices about who about who we work with and how we work with different people um so i don't know one so i'm part of a a theater collective that does a giant annual spectacle performance for the Jewish Spring Carnival Holiday Purim. Um, we're a we're a multi generational mixed ability, mostly trans. I think pretty much always pretty much entirely queer collective. We're explicitly diasporist and anti Zionist. That means that who that who we work with is shaped by all of those commitments. We're not going to work in a venue that our people can't physically get into. Um, and a lot of venues are not going to work with us because we're anti-Zionist. The venue where we've been for the last five, six years is a very mainline I wouldn't necessarily call them conservative, but their reputation as being the synagogue in New York that has the largest population of cops and ex-cops in its membership. Um, they made an explicit statement, their board, a couple years ago, that they would not impose the litmus test around Zionism. No other synagogue, including ones that have progressive reputations, to my knowledge, has done that. That's because of the relationships that we've built with them by talking with them, by working in their spaces, by having a friend who bridged the initial, um, made the initial connection, um, who is beloved both by us and by the leadership there. And so I guess I'm less interested in, in unity than in relation and mm. in thinking in a really specific and concrete way about what it is to be in relation, what it is to be in right relation, which as a phrase has come into movements and cultural workspaces, specifically from indigenous communities and organizers and cultural workers. Uh, yeah, that's, that is sort of the, the aesthetics of politics is, is that uh, sensitivity to gradations and variation and, and yeah, where relation can be made and where on principle, you wouldn't do it, and so on. Yeah, I love that. It it sort of gives us a, like a, a the richer everyday texture, which to me, to me that's that's how organizers think, right? Other than pe rather than people who just sort of sign on to things, because that's yeah, that's the thing. But then actually, it, can you actually tease out a little bit how is being an organizer different to a cultural worker or not, or connected, or uh, how do you see those things as related? I find it harder and harder to distinguish between the two, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and part of that is, um, is that I think a lot of the, 
the idea that they're different things comes from particular kinds of professionalization um, where that lead to even organize even a lot of organizers who are cultural workers if they're professional organizers seeing the two things as different and so not seeing to my mind the ways that cultural work is organizing mm -hmm. where what we do even if we're doing solo work is gather people together for a particular purpose. Um, and the, the notion that the audience is passive and the performer or writer or whatever form of cultural worker is the only active agent is, is, the, flip, is the flip side and the same thing as the idea that the organizer is active and the other people involved in the work are passive and neither of those things is true. And if we, if we understand organizing and cultural work as the main, as distinct mainly, mainly because of some of the purpose of gathering people together mm. sometimes, um, then I think we, we get it, we get a little bit at what's wrong with both of those ideas. Uh, of, of the three of us, you know, I, I chose to be a writer, which is the least collaborative art form you could possibly imagine. Although it is collaborative, I have to like strongly stress rather than never solo. But I, I feel like there was a sense that um, uh, 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 escape from dealing with transness for me was like writing was the space where I could do that. But Isabel, you sort of did the opposite. You became a filmmaker. Like to me, that's sort of like the, one of the most collaborative practices you can possibly imagine. So how, how did you in, negotiate uh, being a filmmaker in what in, you know, as what in American terms is, is a trans woman of color? Yeah, it's interesting because like you said, filmmaking is collaborative, but I ended up wearing multiple creative hats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, you do all the roles. In making yeah. Linga Franca. And, you know, I wrote, I directed, I played the protagonist. I also edited the film. And I think these are the critical creative, you know, roles that are important for me to translate my vision of the film from the page to the screen. Um, you know, when you think about it, being a filmmaker is, you know, more like being a conductor of an orchestra. And, that comes with its own stresses and challenges because they're musicians that are not on the same page. And although to be honest, for me, I don't consider <laughs> filmmaking collaborative because you know it's the auteur that has the vision and you are really assembling a team that are going to help you and assist you realize, you know, your vision and my goal as an artist, which might be in um, at odds with the professional goals of a filmmakers are trying to make into Hollywood is to evolve and innovate the medium of film. Um, and that's why I feel like in a way, it's surprising to me that Lingua Franca resonated with people because it it's so personal in a sense that it's almost idiosyncratic. Mm -hmm. And I want to continue to experiment with, with film as a medium in my artistic practice. And that's how I can also contribute to advancing and evolving trans femme aesthetic. Um, my question is, do we invent or come up with a distinctive and singular aesthetic in different media, um, like film, for instance? And I feel like my focus now is expressing and conveying sensuality mm. and film in a radical or subversive way that hasn't been done before. And if such an aesthetic kind of hits a critical 
tipping point? Um, does it then get defined as a trans femme aesthetic? And then we continue to evolve both aesthetics in general and trans femme aesthetics in particular. But I'm not, I'm also not saying that I'm consciously thinking of that. It's my individual journey. I feel like um, I'm not trying to pump out, you know, hits for Hollywood, but I want to be able to leave a mark on the medium where I develop an aesthetic or a sensibility that would give audiences a new emotional experience because art is re and cinema for that matter is are ultimately emotional experiences. Yeah, that's the thing I love about uh, Link Franker is that you know, to me it is a film only you could have made. Uh, you know, in, in your, you know, as a, uh, and, and then the categories start to seem a little bit overbearing, you know, as, as a trans woman, as a Filipino, but no, it's <laughs> inhabiting that. Uh, and then like, yeah, there's the little texture of, and yes, that is one of the best trans sex scenes ever filmed, um, but there's also care for an elderly person. Yes. And, and so just the, and, and, and then the range of, of ways that sort of touch and attention go between the characters and the yeah. characters. The camera yeah to me that's that's something there's something really special about that but but you you write something i find really interesting about that and, and it's sort of uh a major aesthetic proposition for things that cost money like film is how can a work of art that's really you know in this case uh, a trans woman's sensibility um be generalizable for an audience that's not that and didn't come for that yeah um For me, it's really, would you mind rephrasing that question, Mackenzie? I'm trying to think about my answer and. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and, and I, I know a lot of people who, who really uh, resonated with that film who aren't trans and don't really know a lot of trans people other than me, you know, but they, yeah. they sort of felt things about uh, your protagonist's struggle around her interactions with men or her yeah. precariousness or just she does a service job like it has all these threads you can connect yeah. and yet to me it's a film that kind of only only a trans woman that is you could have made yeah i think part of it is also you know formal choices that i made that ended up making the film feel intimate and impressionistic and truly coming from a specific subjectivity and that of like the trans woman immigrant of color. Um, it has to do with a combination of I think, and it's strange how it's really manipulating artificial elements like image and sound to be able to create those um, authentic and genuine emotions. Like there are, the film opens and closes with hushed voiceovers by the main protagonists over desolate landscapes in Coney Island. Um, and even though you open the film visually with a montage of iconic scenes of America, you know, you hear words in a foreign tongue. That's kind of like staking a claim that this might look like another New York film, but I am telling it in my voice and in my own story. Um, and language at the beginning. Yes, yeah. And yeah. also the way it was shot and that, I think the film invites audiences to put in a little more work um, in terms of engagement. It's narratively sparse. You know, I'm not trying to spoon feed. I'm not giving, it's not transgender 101 or transgender for dummies for a cisgender audience. Um, I, I think I'm approaching it with a certain <laughs> arrogance as an artist that I'm gonna make you work to understand and get the art that I made here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's also partly why the people that appreciate the film find it rewarding and that they're not being spoon fed and yeah, as learning about the characters 
is not simply a matter of listening to the dialogue. It's more importantly paying attention to the silences and the pauses and the gaps in between. Mm. And I think the process of putting in that much emotional effort really is what empathy is about, you know, empathy through cinema in that you're putting yourself in the shoes of their characters and their circumstances, as in the case of Olivia. Rosa, and here again, I have the advantage of uh, having read something that's forthcoming, but, uh, but in this conversation, you sort of started by talking about uh, the kind of everyday working class bar culture, uh, ballroom culture as, as trans women of color uh, experience uh, and so on. And in, and in your writing, for me, you've expanded that out into actually a kind of an aesthetic that then is looking also at works of art. And I was, I was wondering if you'd like to pick up uh, maybe any of the ones you you were talking about there. Lorena Botner comes to mind, but there are others where we can think about, oh, if you pay attention to the everyday life of trans people, you can actually develop aesthetics specific to that. Sure, yeah. And I think, I think, Lor I think um, Lorenzo Buckner is, uh, is probably a great, a great person to talk about for that. So, so this is someone, an artist who, whose work I first encountered a couple years ago um, when a friend of mine who, um, a friend of mine happened to stumble across a show, a small show that Paul Preciado put together um, for Documenta, I think. Um, and then, and she and my friend Katie happened to see that, knew I would be excited about, um, about Brickner's work and, and pointed me her way. And then by sheer chance, um, summer of 2019, um, I happened to get to see uh, the sort of follow-up to that show, which, um, which has made it to this continent um, this year, of course, when it's real hard to go anywhere to see it. Um, but so, so Lorenzo Buckner is an incredible um, armless trans artist in many media who was active and I'm going into the, into all this detail so that folks who haven't um, haven't heard of her will hopefully get excited and and I yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it. you've got the link in the chat. Um, who was active from the late '70s until the early '90s um, when she died in the um, in the HIV/AIDS pandemic. Um, so her work is very is very deliberately posed against the the eugenic imperatives targeting both trans folks and disabled folks um, and a lot of it is either direct self portraiture or sort of I don't know, kind of the relation to self-portraiture that maybe Isabel was just talking about in terms of, um, in terms of her film, um, but is a body like hers in an incredible array of situations, some of them from what I think it's possible to glean directly drawn from her life as a as a constant wild performance of gender in both um, in every space from queer sex clubs to sidewalk um, chalk painting to her gallery performances, including a tour de force of herself as the Venus de Milo, um, but breaking out of the pedestal to, um, to dance with and talk with the audience who she'd gathered. 
Um, so to me, part of what's incredible and exciting about her work is that it takes the very distinct material of her everyday life as someone who would be present in spaces in everything from a beard with diagonal tiger stripes cut in it and sailor pants to a um, a vinyl and gauze um, party dress to white marbleized um, body paint. Um, and stays constantly in that space where her particular body is never avoidable, mm -hmm. um, but also pulls up into this very, into these very formal performances and media, as well as much less so. Um, and that deeply individual um, grounding that comes out of being in spaces where there are other folks who are legible in similar ways, whether as disabled, as trans, as the kind of deep freak that she clearly was, um, makes possible the, uh, the, uh, the artistic and cultural work that pulls out of that specific individual body life experience. This is uh, bittersweet to me in the sense that uh, Butner is roughly my contemporary, you know, was, was born only three years before me. I, I feel the same way about Greer Langton, uh, who I, and who would be two years older than me, neither of whom are with us. Uh, and I, I kind of feel there's like a missing, obviously they're artists, uh, you know, born circa 1960, who are trans, but I feel like there's like a missing generation of us around that time. And partly because of, uh, you know, have, people who were sexually active before the HIV pandemic got generalized is, is the gap kind of thing. And that affected trans women a lot. Uh, I, I feel like I, I'm interested in how both of you feel about cultural continuity and, and what resources are available to us uh, from a kind of a trans past um, given that there's there's that uh, crater in the middle of it that we're so often missing documentation uh, of trans culture uh, that isn't you know sort of rich white people in the West, so yeah, where do, where do we find our resources to to make art out of out of our own past? I feel like so. To me, at least, there's a couple of there's a couple of different answers. Um, one is that there's there's an incredible interruption of continuity from the HIV pandemic, and another incredible interruption of continuity from the the period from the mid 70s to the late 80s when the when a lot of the space for trans women's cultural work that had emerged in the 60s and 70s in lesbian spaces and in what became more particularly gay male spaces um, was cut off. Um, but there's also a lot of continuity that doesn't get talked about either because it's within particular subcultural spaces and in particular the ball scene. The ball scene has is an unbroken river really from the 1910s to now, but in its current form from the late 60s to now. Um, and there are incredible poets and, and singers and performers of all kinds who emerge from that scene. Um, 
and are largely ignored when we talk about this history. But there's also a sort of a weird relationship to the carriers of continuity of the scenes that Bruckner and Langton and Ethel Eichelberger um, and others were part of, where a lot of a lot of people are dead, but those those lineages of cultural work have kept going with real direct acknowledgement of those of those figures and those voices in them through the work largely of lesbians, queer women, dykes of all flavors from Jennifer Miller um, and her um, current side project, the Eichelberglers, um, which is a band performing Ethel Eichelberger's um, music. I had no idea. You got to drop a link for that one later. <laughs> <laughs> um, to Split Bridges, to Jenny Romaine and Great Small Works, and so on. And those aren't the same kind of continuity that would exist if Ethel Eichelberger were around to tell us what their relationship to the category of trans is, or if Greer Langton were around. Um, but we also, um, but we also do have um, folks like Miracele Ross um, going strong in um, in Canada, though less visible um, publicly. Um, we have folks like Jane County, um, who has reemerged in New York um, over the past couple years. Um, and I'm maybe more, I'm, I'm deeply angered and frustrated by the very real interruptions, but there's also, do we actually look for the continuities? Do we talk to the people? Do we, especially now that more resources are around, do we read Mira Soleil Ross and Sandra Philippa's work? Um, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, if, if there are any uh, uh, cultural historians out there in the, the audience, it's like, boy, have we got projects for you, you know. <laughs> and, and at the level, yes, of, of documentation and recovery and, and, and so forth. And I should just say that that's just talking about folks in the capital A art world. Yes, exactly. Uh, where yeah. a lot of the continuity that I think is most important is not that. It's on the dance floors, it's on the bar stools, it's hanging out on hanging out on the pier and seeing who wanders by. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's my school of cultural history: is is you go have drinks with people and and uh, participate in in worlds uh, rather than just through documentation. But that's that's sort of a larger conversation. Uh, that other source of 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 us in a way is is of course we can draw on on uh, cis femininity. Uh, Isabel, you mentioned Jane Fonda, uh, you know, one, one that's close to my heart because I feel my whole transition was, was from uh, Barbarella Jane Fonda to Claire Jane Fonda. Like to me, that was a whole growth and I still honor both of them, but to find my way from one to the other. Could you, could you just like uh, just say a little more about uh, your relation to, to her work and particularly her marvelous performance in Clue? Yeah, um, so when I was saying that it was after I moved to the US that I started really asking myself, you know, questions about whether it was trans was also prompted by, you know, me seeing Clute. I mean, it came out in 1971, which is, and I always use this example, just two years after Sweet Charity with, um, what's her name? Shirley MacLaine by, um, but it seemed like a very, so we try to seem a very archaic, antiquated, 
film and its conception of femininity, whereas just three years later when Jane Fonda felt to me like a very hyper-modern um, expression of what it is to be a woman. Um, she's complicated and complex. She's dark, she's flawed. And through it all, she remains to be an agent who's tough and resilient and a survivor. And in certain ways, she's, her character in Clute, uh, Brie Daniels, feels like a prototype for my character, Olivia, in Lingua Franca, and that they're living in New York City through a fraught and, you know, tense environment that's tinged with an ease. And interestingly, watching Jane Fonda in that film both helped me find a path forward as a woman and also as an artist. Um, and you know, her Brie Daniels is such an antidote to the flat caricaturish portrayals of trans women. In the Philippines, of course, you know, Brie is not trans, but for me, just trying to wrap my head around what kind of woman I can become, I'm not verbatim and like, you know, what her particular character, but the attributes and just the depth and complexity and the ambivalence as well within her character. This is a woman who's trying to change her life, but is also played by her own demons. And, um, and it was how I ended up writing my very first feature script, um, Senorita, which was much more a direct and literal adaptation of Clute in a way, but it's very, very um, mangled because I did not go to film school. It was really, my film school was making my own films. And so I think, it's Jane a really great Fonda place. And, I gotta say, you know, it's like you're, you're being modest about it. It's an extraordinary film. Uh, um, you know, I credit really Jane Fonda and Bree Daniels to be able to help me dig deeper and go beyond the flat, um, one dimensional hmm. characterizations of trans women that I've seen in film. And while I was shooting the film and playing a trans woman in Senorita, I acted in the film too. I hadn't even transitioned yet. You know, I hadn't told anyone. It was a way for me to test the waters of whether I was trans. And when I was both, you know, acting and working behind the scenes of that film and playing that character just felt right to me. It, brought me one step closer to the epiphany that I was trans. And I waited until after I finished my second film to transition, but I eventually did. And it's because I made my first film. Yeah, so, I, I gotta go over this because this is the most extraordinary transition story I ever heard that, that you wrote, directed and starred in a movie about a trans woman where you played that trans woman before you became one. I just think that's the, one of the most amazing transition stories that there is. <laughs> it's extraordinary. And, and, and that uh, uh, Jane Fonda's portrayal of, of Brie Daniels, yeah, it was a resource. And, and that character is also a sex worker uh, in Senorita. Yes. Uh, but your character in Lingua Franca is not. And I, I find that really interesting that uh, it still seems connected to Brie Daniels in the sense that she performs a kind of affective labor of care, but it's for an elderly person. And you sort of see this is all the same kind of work. And this is all also the unpaid everyday work that trans women have to do all the time just to perform a femininity to to not to positively get paid and really negatively not get hurt yeah uh, it, it seems to me to really sort of branch out from uh, uh what jane fonda was doing in that role yeah and eventually i do think that i really want to revisit um 
clued again and you know I would want to play you know a sex worker on film in a way that hasn't been played before mm-hmm. in American cinema and imbue it with the same layers and nuance and subtlety but I also don't want to just you know rip off Jane Fonda's performance and clue in the character as well. Look, if Brian De Palma can rip off Hitchcock for an entire career and never do anything else, you can, you're totally welcome to just do Jane Fonda, I think. <laughs> Seems totally legit to me. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, Rosa, uh, you actually been talking a lot about the cis women we learn from, but in the context of uh, lesbian, or, or I think more precisely the word dyke community is kind of appropriate there. And I wonder if you could expand a little on, on that theme. Hmm. Say more. I feel like I could go in too many directions. Yeah, well, the, and, and it, it seems to how you're kind of conceiving this, and, and I don't want to mythologize this, but there were um, places and times where there's uh, a dyke culture that actually did include uh, trans women, not necessarily under these terms at all. Uh, but then there were moments of kind of uh, exclusion. And, and my experience of that was very much the arrival of a much more uh, middle-class, you know, kind of textually schooled uh, kind of lesbian separatism that also tended to exclude kind of street dykes and bar dykes as well, that we kind of got left out with other people. And maybe it's helpful for us to retell this story in terms of the cis women we also got kind of excluded with. But is, 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 does that, and this is my experience of, of, um, of Australia, which is a slightly different context, but, but I wonder if that tracks with the history that you're, you're sort of unearthing. Yeah, I mean, to my understanding, definitely. If, um, so I guess I'll keep giving footnotes. Um, Beth Elliott's amazing memoir, Mirrors, um, which I think may actually be back in print or at least back more easily available. Um, is a lot. A lot of it is the is the story of that shift. Um, so up until the early the early mid seventies, um, there wasn't much controversy in um, in whether trans women were welcome in dyke spaces. Um, Beth Elliott was on the. Um, the editorial group of um, of the latter, which was the pre Stonewall um, major publication at, from the Daughters of Belitis, um, Sandy Stone was the recording engineer at Olivia Records, which basically created the women's music um, world on the recording side. Um, and there was a very, a very deliberate um, attack, which, as you say, was very much part of the same the same thing as going after Bush femme Bardite culture, going after sex workers, going after a whole range of of. Mm, I'm looking for the right word. I think maybe degenerate is the proper one to connect it to the eugenic project. Yes. Um, and what one thing that I've been finding interesting as I've been digging into that history a little bit lately um, is the specific role that Robin Morgan played um, as someone who was trying desperately to hold on to some kind of cred in a um, in the radical end of a feminist movement where the line between straight women and lesbians was increasingly mapping onto the the radical and not line. So first she did a whole, I've got a girlfriend, but she's underground move (laughs) um, in relation to now I 
I'm not going to say a name because I can't now can't remember which person it was. Um, but and then when when basically she totally burned the person who she was claiming was her um, was her girlfriend in Canada. Um, she then went, she then was very central as another clout gathering move in going after trans women um, in the context of the West Coast Lesbian Conference um, in 74, which is sort of one of the main turning points in all of this. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's a way in which I think dyke communities need to reckon with the way that they slash we got played in that moment. And the clinging to that move as if it were a genuine expression of coming from lesbian communities is one of the weirdest things about the whole thing because it just ain't true. Yeah. Um, but I can say that, for, that by the mid nineties, um, the, the queer spaces that I came out into were dyke spaces. Um, and that was because of the political shifts that happened in particular in, um, in, queer, in the queer punk world um, as the 90s wave of trans visibility politics, trans radical politics and culture hit. Um, and so the world that I came out into was very much built by folks from, from riot, DC Riot Girl in particular, um, and was explicitly enthusiastic about trans folks and as well as about disability justice and a whole range of other things. Um, and since then, I've seen a couple of flows back and forth um, with all of that. But I think it's, I think that that context is incredibly important, especially because as I continually harp on, the best statistics we have show that straight trans folks are a small minority of us. Um, and that's something that I think a lot of trans spaces have yet to reckon with, and also a lot of non-trans spaces have yet to reckon with, um, especially given the ways that some of that small slice of trans folks who are heterosexual or primarily heterosexual are exactly the trans men who get focused on and fetishized by folks who insist on not thinking of themselves as straight or in heterosexual relationships when they are in heterosexual relationships with those men. Yeah, there's a lot of history to uh, revisit, and I'm, I'm just thinking this through my own experience of uh, moving to Sydney in 1980, attempting to be a gay man at the moment when femininity was being squeezed out of gay male culture altogether in favour of like the clone look uh, of being a number and so on. So the, the space in that to be a uh, very effeminate faggot queen was, was really being compressed. And then finding myself in lesbian culture uh, that weirdly was accepting of that even before I knew I was trans, uh, that there was a space where that, you know, where I could kind of could exist as well. Uh, but yeah, I, I, you mentioned one of the key uh, uh, exclusions that happened and Robin Morgan was, was central to that. I'm thinking also of the Barnard Conference where like, you know, can lesbians do s &M? was a question that had to be fought out. Um, so there's the exclusion of bar dykes, uh, butch femme, uh, s and trans women, sex workers, there's at least five moments you can go back and kind of say there were, there were other lesbian cultures. And I guess on the other side, there are other uh, cultures centering gay male masculinity that have excluded forms of femininity out of them as well. I kind of wonder if um, the trans culture is the thing we even imagine exists is because of you know, sort of all of these exclusions that happened between the other two spaces you might have inhabited. So it's like, well, I guess we have to be together and <laughs> no one else will have us. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, 
extemporizing and there'd be a lot of careful work to sort of piece that story together and even just in the Western context. Um, now I'm looking at uh, JC and, and my Brooklyn Rail people to see if we want to do some questions when we want to wrap up by. Yeah, we can, we've got a little bit more time. We can definitely um, jump to questions now or yeah, as, I think as you like, but if now's a good time, let, we can, can just jump into it. Yeah, anybody, I can't, I can't see everybody. Um, but JC, you seeing any hands up anywhere? Yeah, I think we've had a we've had a bunch of good a bunch of good action in a bunch of good comments in the chat. Um, I know I'm sure people have a lot of things a lot of things percolating. Um, I maybe I'll just maybe I'll just start us maybe I'll just start us off though and give people a little bit of time to to get their thoughts together. Um, Rosa said something super interesting about unity that I think a lot of people are like, whoa. Um, <laughs> Cause there's a lot of rhetoric around unity and I'm just going to digress a little bit into my, my like other, my like outside of art life. There's a, there's a fairly well-known kind of community group in skateboarding and that is explicitly trans inclusive and, and just very intersectional. And they did a lot of work to really open skateboarding up as a culture. Um, and their, their name is unity. Um, and I wondered if, if any of you kind of have, and I think Rosie, you touched on this, but but there seems to be there are these various levels that we can kind of like pick our pick the fight on in terms of like making space for trans people and 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 making space for for trans perspectives, not just to exist, but to kind of like um, affect culture. And and I guess I wonder if there's a lot of um, like unity as an idea maybe works on really small levels, and then as soon as you you start jumping out, but I guess. So I guess my question is sort of like, if if you can talk about time, um, talk more about either like um, surprising coalitions that maybe you had to form, uh, maybe Isabel also with with making with making a film, especially like I'm sure there was, I, I was thinking during the meet during like the the scene in the meet in like the the first scene in the meet in the butcher in the butcher that's it was said I I couldn't help but think like like thinking about you in that space. And and yeah, so I guess a question about uh, surprising coalitions and the idea of unity versus kind of like productive tension, if that makes any sense. I know extremely rambly, I'm sorry. I can rephrase that also. <laughs> totally get it. I just, uh, I'm waiting for my co-panelists if anybody wants to jump on that one. I think, Rose, you actually gave us one in terms of working with a synagogue you would otherwise think as, as you know, conservative, whatever that means. And those can be shifting targets. Yeah, I'm trying to think of think about other other examples that in particular ones that seem related to this, but but I've also been going on a lot. So Isabel, if you have thoughts. Um, I'm still thinking. <laughs> or Isabel, if you, want, if you also could talk a little bit about that, like filming in, um, I, I, was, I was thinking a lot about the sort of like uh, different immigrant experiences. And um, I'm, I'm, I come from like Italian immigrants and I think there's a lot of like really the, the sort of like um the the pressure on like male on like men immigrants to to do the providing and and to make it um exacerbates i think a lot of the like kind of like very traditional types of masculinity it's, um and i wondered if maybe you wanted to talk a bit about kind of navigating those spaces either in the film or outside of the film i think you know in the philippine Philippine next diaspora, it's quite um, interesting because I feel like the gender roles in terms of who's the breadwinner is kind of reversed because a lot of um, jobs um, here in the US for immigrants from the Philippines tend to be in the healthcare sector. Um, and so it's usually women 
that migrate, you know, from the Philippines to here, whether they assume roles within, you know, formal institutions like a hospital system or more informal ones um, like being a caregiver or um, a home health aid, which a lot of undocumented immigrants take on because they can't really work as nurses. And anyway, there's, it's feminist in a certain sense for me, um, for the woman or the Filipino trans woman to be the breadwinner and, you know, earning a living for their family back home. Um, of course, you know, it really depends on the occupation and the sector, like, for instance, uh, working in an abattoir or a slaughterhouse is still a predominantly masculine or male profession, if that makes any sense. And like for me as both um, a filmmaker and a performing, you know, going to these different spaces, I, I didn't allow myself to feel, which I guess is, you know, a, a privilege in the sense in that I was working with a crew, and so I was I didn't feel threatened or vulnerable the entire time because here I was, this trans woman of color who's calling the shots and ordering around <laughs> this cisgender white male, mostly white male, where half of them were white males. You know, production crew members, and it was strangely an empowering and emboldening experience. Um, of course, you know, there was a struggle in terms of, you know, this is really the first film set where I experienced pushback from collaborators. And perhaps it is because, you know, as a woman, a trans woman specifically, you know, you're just easily challenged and questioned by, you know, by men. And perhaps it's also partly because I was wearing these multiple hats and including, you know, editing my own film, which um, conventional <laughs> or common sense would tell you that editors, you know, directors should not be editing their own films, but Steven Soderbergh does it, so. Why can't I? <laughs> right. Yeah. As, as did Jesse Rovinelli, whose film came yes. out. Yes. Yeah, of course. An editor and, oh, and, and I think shoots in a certain way because of being an editor. Editors know things, right? Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting, editing in America is traditionally women's work in cinema as well. So I think centrally, to center the editor, I think is a whole way of thinking. But, uh, I, I could I could rattle on about that. I also want to know if the the uh, slaughterhouse scene in your film connects in any way to Fassbinder's Year of Thirteen Moons. Um, not really, but it more um, I'm referencing more directly a film by the Filipino auteur Lino Broca um, in Shang, ah. which is in the Criterion Collection, and it also opens in a slaughterhouse. It's a social realist film from the 70s that's set in the slums of Manila. Of course, you know a whole other film history about which I'm ignorant. So thank you for that note. <laughs> no, I have to do some homework. <laughs> All right, I have a, a question from uh, Jay Sebastian. Yeah, so uh, Jay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Jay to unmute. Um, sure, you can ask a person if you like. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, well, my question is regards notions of truth and morality and how androgyny has been mythologized in philosophy and perhaps how it corresponds to the construction of the trans femme aesthetic and yeah, thank you. Yeah, all right, I got thoughts on that, but anybody else wanna have that first? Rosa, Isabel? Hmm. Sorry, I was answering a question in the chat about the film that I, that I mentioned. And that one's in uh, Criterion, you said? Criterion, yeah. Great. I mean, one, hmm. 
I guess, so, and this is partly, I think, a, a response that comes from being the, being the particular age I am and having, um, and having been in college in a particular moment of um, queer theory effervescence. Um, I think there's, I think there's less that I find useful in the, um, in the sort of, Mm. formal philosophic stuff around androgyny, liminality, etc. Um, in relation to trans femme aesthetic stuff, then in the the sort of other the other thing um, of the the, the kinds of things that can get called philosophizing that happen through, through everyday practice, whether we're talking about the ways that, um, the ways that trans women and trans people generally do very fine adjustments of our presentation, in various situations for a whole lot of reasons, everything from cruising to safety. Um, but, tho but those things, those kinds of things seem to me more interestingly related to the, the everyday practice of other relationships to the category of gender than the Christian Roman European two gender model um, that that's dominant here. Um, so, so I feel like there's a whole other set of things that are about the, I wouldn't say morality, I'd say ethics, about ethics and relation and how gender works into that, both in contexts where historically gender is not a social thing. Um, and I'm thinking of, and I'm gonna fuck up her name because I can't do the tones, um, Oyaranke Oyuwumi's work on Yoruba um, traditional non-relationship to gender, um, but also in indigenous cultures of all, of a very wide variety where relation is a thing that's going on and it has a strong relationship to ethics and the, the everyday practices of being different kinds of person um, are deeply wound up in that. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also a deep European fairly orientalist tradition of thinking about queer and trans stuff through those, through that, through a sort of anthropological relationship, folks like Edward Carpenter in Intermediate Sex and, and so on down in service of liberationist agendas. But I also feel like, I don't know, I'm more interested in Coley Driscoll's work on um, Cherokee, gender stuff um, as an embedded piece of a culture that thinks about relation and ethics um, as key than in yeah. other, other kinds of philosophy. It's a big project and, and, and there's a way in which, you know, this two gender system is, was a colonial project that was imposed uh, often by force. Uh, for example, the uh, indigenous people where San Diego is now uh, had had three genders. We don't even know the name of the third one. The Spanish called them Hoyas or Jewels uh, and exterminated them to make it a two gender system. And all we know is that third gender was in charge of things like burial. Uh, and so that took away uh, a significant rite of passage for a whole group of indigenous peoples. But yeah, I, I think like Rosa, I'm, I'm wary of wanting to 
uh, then like a tourist, like take on other people's gender systems and re-import them. Uh, but I think it's worth, you know, sort of memorializing the fact that imposing this gender system was a colonial project. Uh, and then also looking, if it's the culture you inhabit, looking internally to how, uh, how were other genders policed and exterminated even within Western cultures is, you know, worth doing. Uh, the, you know, there was a cult in Rome that uh, worshipped the god Sibyl, and on the 24th of March, which a day which I think we should celebrate, you could join the cult by severing off your own testicles, and, and then there would be a huge party. Not that I'm recommending we do that part, but, you know, maybe it's a day we could celebrate like a lost tradition. Uh, Emma Heaney has a good book on uh, the new woman that's got to do with how modernity, particularly modern literature, made a lot out of uh, trans femininity as if it was sort of a key to understanding both possibility and pathology. Uh, so there's a way that, that transness in this sense of in-betweenness rather than destination becomes a kind of um, mystery or answer or fascination for cis people that I think trans people were a little less interested in that maybe. But I have been wondering, uh, given the composition of the Supreme Court in the United States now, if maybe uh, a trans femme religion wouldn't be a bad idea uh, that adds a kind of sacred language to the political and aesthetic ones through which we think about our being, and that one might have equivalent ones for non-binary people and for trans men and so on, but they're, when they're maybe not the same thing, they're different. Uh, we all have a journey and a transition, but they're different. Uh, so to start, maybe it's timely in the States to start revisiting you know, those figures a little bit, but yeah, I'm always a little wary about how um, transness is equated with androgynousness and by all means be androgynous if you want, but they're not necessarily the same experience and how it gets treated as if it's the answer to a mystery for somebody else. And I think that I'm answering a little bit, uh, Kay had uh, a question there as well along those lines. Yeah, that there's so much ambivalence around these inherited, I mean, there's a really interesting book called, um, I think it's Confessions or Memoir of a, an, uh, an Autogyne uh, by Ralph Werner, AKA Jenny June, that's um, pre-medicalized transculture in New York City. Um, super interesting stuff to realize that even in, you know, sort of Eurocentric America, there were other cultures of gender that was lost. All right. So, yeah, and there's, there's Hooges and India and so on, but I don't want to, like, I, I think it's just problematic to be looking to the other because you're still involved in a colonial project when you do that, I think, uh, to, to have people speak from where they are. And, and to wait until you're invited to be a guest in relation to that culture. Uh, there, there, are, there are white people in Yoruba-based religions, but they're, they're initiated practitioners. Uh, they're, they're not, you know, you can't just show up and claim that stuff. Um, all it's, right. I've got a question from, a, from a Donna. Do you, do you mind if we go to that quickly before we jump to the poem? And I would love to get um, any resources about the, the, the Kumeye um, third gender would be extremely appreciated. Um, Donna, I'm gonna ask you to activate your microphone now, or I'm also happy to, we can uh, Sure, thank you uh, for giving me the floor. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for this amazing, inspiring discussion. I'm actually, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the new Gucci Gas Van Sant commercial slash uh, web series. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but probably yes, because Preciado stars in the first episodes and uh, Silvia Calderoni who is a, an icon. I am Italian and she's an icon in the queer lesbian community. She is the main protagonist. Uh, so I'm curious to learn how you would assess the kind of work that uh, this commercial does in relation to the topics that we are discussing. I teach a class on actually reading Testo Junkie and all my students, like most of them are, are queer, trans, and they were outraged by the presence of Preciado in the web series. But anyways, I, I don't want you to talk about why Preciado is doing this, but I'm more interested in understanding uh, what's your take about uh, the kind of work that the web series does in connection to the topics that we are discussing 
whether this web series uh, pushes uh, to the mainstream a certain kind of trans, uh, gender, queer, non-binary aesthetics. Uh, and in the moment in which uh, it does so, uh, does it depotentiate uh, this uh, non-binary uh, queer trans aesthetics from its uh, potential, uh, revolutionary potentials, you know? Um, and uh, also, yeah, and also because we are talking about also working class people versus, I mean, I think class uh, is a tissue in our discussion. So I wonder also like uh, the role of like uh, this kind of operation, commercial operation of uh, uh, giving like this uh, aesthetics, like trans queer aesthetics, like uh, a new touch that makes it fashionable, fuckable, but only for the, the not for the have nots, of course. And uh, yeah. Well, I, I don't know if uh, I, I've seen the, this piece. I don't know if Isabel or, or Rosa have seen it. Uh, I love the protagonist of it, uh, who I wasn't aware of, uh, as as an older trans woman appearing, you know, in a high fashion. It's like yes, I I loved it, uh, and I'm I'm probably in a real minority among trans women who's a huge Paul Preciado fan. You know, it sort of doesn't resonate <laughs> with the sisters quite as much as it does with me for historical reasons and sharing a similar culture and age too. I think. Uh, and it's interestingly the least controversial of, you know, like the more assimilable Preciado is in it. Um, but, and, and much as I love Paul, uh, there is a way in which to me it confuses the political with the aesthetic a lot. Uh, and and it's, I, well, I think it was so helpful to have these conversations here today that uh, there, there is a way in which, you know, an aesthetic on its own doesn't necessarily do anything for anyone. but. Uh, I hope, I, and I forget her name, Sylvia, the protagonist, I hope she got some great Chanel swag out of it. Like, uh, I, you know, I'm totally here for sisters getting paid uh, in any way possible. Um, but I just feel like uh, there's a way in which it ends up being a very derivative thing. And, um, and Gus Van Sant just doesn't seem to know what 21st century uber fashionable uh, uh, trans culture is, and neither does Gucci really, in, in a way, you know, it's kind of like, they're really like those colors, you know, it's sort of so remote in a way from the real agency, like so much of uh, American popular femininity at the moment in terms of style, you can trace back to um, black and sex worker of color aesthetic from 10 years ago. Yeah, like that's sort of where a lot of it originated. Um, and then we get this very, like derivative version of it. So yeah, sisters getting paid. I'm always there for that. And we work within capitalism. You don't get to choose how you work at all usually. So good luck with that. And I love the older uh, trans woman body that we see mostly naked and she's hot, you know, like I'm totally down. <laughs> but yeah, it's not, it's not a work of art. I think one needs to pay too much attention to beyond that. I, I don't know if anybody else has seen it who would like to think, to think about it. I haven't seen it. Uh, and, and full disclosure, I'm doing an interview for a website for a shoe company where I'm getting paid in shoes, which I'm doing <laughs> because I love the shoes and they cost a fortune. So, yeah. <laughs> so I'm quite judgeable and by the same criteria. Sorry, Rosa. Oh, I haven't seen it. I guess to me, the questions are always, and this is um a certain kind of unreconstructed marxism in my anarchism um what i think matters most is is who's making the decisions who's doing the work behind the camera who's doing the work on the set um who's who's getting both the pay and the credits in those sides of in those sides of things because that's what keeps more people fed and housed mm -hmm. um and and is also how there are the relationships that have the potential at least even though it's pretty thin most of the time for people to have at least the kind of connection to who's being depicted that means that they might get a pissed off phone call from someone whose opinion they care about 
um, if they're um, if they're making decisions that don't that either don't serve the people who are being depicted or that serve the sort of commercialization of fa of face to face non commercialized mm -hmm. culture mm -hmm. um can't say i've seen a lot of that be particularly successful in my life i could rattle off a list of radical queers of the late 90s who who have made certain specific aesthetics totally useless to the communities that created them mm -hmm. through jobs at anthropology and various other places, um, not to mention driving gentrification um, and them getting pissed off phone calls from people who they purportedly cared about did not have a great impact. But at least then there's some avenue of relation involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm really here for yeah. that. Uh, where when do trans artists get budgets that imply that we can work for with a cis audience, but where yeah the the work's ours, we get to own part of it, and and formally it does something that only we can do with the medium. And you know, ladies, gentlemen, and others, I give you Isabel Sandoval's uh, Lingua Franca as the kind of Exhibit A. It does exactly that. Uh, I've written elsewhere about Jesse Rovinelli's So Pretty, which was to me was the other trans film last year that I think like hit all those notes uh, and and was you know formally interesting by us for us, but it's available to an audience uh, that includes others and and shows what we can do for audiences uh, and and hence why we should have budgets. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So I think um, JC, I, we yeah we've got one more we've got one more question. Um, Fong's going to close us out. And then, um, and then we'll jump over to to our poet today. Um, Fong, I'm asking you to activate your mic. Thank you, JC. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Rosa Mackenzie. This is beautiful conversation. I love it. Um, so I have one question for all of you, but I was very much triggered by Isabel's description of, uh, you know, Jane Fonda. So I was growing up in Vietnam, super torn between seeing her, I think, in Cat Malu. <laughs> uh, remember the cowboy movie? Yeah. And then, like, literally a month later, I remember my mother took me to see Barbarella. <laughs> you know? And then the reason why I respond to Bar Barbarella. Definitely more so than Cabalou, partly because it was directed by Roger Vadim, Roger Vadim, who she was married at the time or after. Don't remember exactly, but my point is that the inclination of liking her beyond the, the, the film script, the beyond the protagonist she play in either movie, but it has to do, thinking back now, you know, the French aesthetic being so different than the American aesthetic. And Vietnam was colonized by the French for 200 years. So I have been thinking about that. And, you know, you mentioned about aesthetics could be a more uh, an ethic, an ethical, um, philosophical position to Rosa, which somehow reminded me so much of the way that I remember reading Kant, you know, the, the, the whole idea of um, teleology, you know? I mean, I think, is it true that we're born with a given aesthetic? Um, you know, a lot of us sometimes took years and an incredible multitude of life experiences in order to, um, I guess, heighten that sensibility, what we call aesthetic occasionally. But my point is that you know, it, 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 some of us, according to Kant, it's like the natural end. It's like you, 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 you might be born to play the, the violin so naturally, but somehow your upbringing and your family pressure and so, social pressure, all kind of pressure, uh, is kept telling you you got to play the trombone. 
much, you know. And then you play the trombone, you're never happy, even though you can be good at it. Um, so my question is, what a, what's the question? Too excited to ask. Very simple. Um, I think we have to work with a static or is it something already born, we born that been hidden below of our, the threshold of our conscious, subconsciousness? Or is it something can be both? I mean, I'm asking you all really. Isabel first, hello, put you in the spot. Fong, so your question is whether aesthetic is something that we, you know, that we create by conscious design or is it something more subconscious? Yes. Um, I think it's a, it's a combination of both for me. I think having made three films and I've said before that I think maybe it was Jean Cocteau that said that an artist or a director makes the same film over and over again and that we tend to gravitate towards or fixate on certain themes or motifs or unresolved conflicts in our life and project that onto the narratives that we um, make in our art. And, you know, it's the conscious decision that we make is whether we actually work on those themes that we obsess on and make them into films, I think, that's what defines an auteur in some sense. Um, there are directors that are for hire <laughs> and just work on studio projects. For me, I'd like to be able to achieve um, enough success um, in the industry in that I'm able to make films about those themes that I'm drawn to but in a language that's still formally inventive, but also accessible to a broader audience that it makes enough money just for me to be able to keep making the same film differently mm -hmm. over the course of my career. Uh -huh. okay. That makes sense, yeah. Um, so, uh, Mackenzie, you wanna go second? Oh, okay. Um, you know, is, is uh, an aesthetic innate or uncultured is the same question is, is transness innate or uncultured? And I, I think it's a question of, and that's not answerable and, and the answer is not interesting in a way. Uh, but I think there's a way that if you treat uh, desire as, as the thing built out of drives that, that governs you know, our, our being, that they're, they're kind of unbidden and, and things that sees and direct you, but how you respond to that is the thing that you can shape. So, you know, if I'm hearing, you know, like pounding techno, I have to dance. That's why I like to rave. Like I have to move, but how I move is the part I have agency over. And to me, that's the sort of aesthetic tension because aesthetic after all is, is ascesis. It just means sensation and perception. Uh, so, and, and that's my answer, for example, to people like Andrea Long Chu, who emphasized the unbiddenness of desire. And I agree with that part, but I think the agency of how you uh, shape the direction of that uh, as a trans person, as an artist or writer, as, as a human, like that's the part that's kind of key. And the, the shaping is the thing that, where that becomes much more uh, a collective project uh, of learning and being together. Yes, so it's constantly evolving. Yeah. Not without its tensions, yeah. yeah. Like sometimes you need a good fight about some of these things. Yeah, thank you. I feel better. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, back to you. And Rosa, did you want to jump in on that? Um, sure, I guess. I don't think anything's natural. Um, much less innate. Um, but I think aesthetics, like most things, are things that happen between people. Um, and I tend to be most excited about that when it's when it's done both deliberately and with some with some excitement about what's unpredictable. Um, which yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's all I can say. 
that's a great place to leave it. Some excitement about what is unpredictable. That's beautiful. Um, as most people here probably know, we have a tradition at the rail of ending our lunches with a poem. And one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that um, because physical distance is less of a barrier, we get to actually invite living poets to come share their work with us. And we're very lucky to have Drew Pham here today to close the afternoon. Drew Pham is a Vietnamese queer transgender writer, a child of war refugees, and an adjunct lecturer at CUNY Brooklyn. She previously served in the US Army and was deployed in Afghanistan with the 10th Mountain Division. She serves as an editor of The Wrath Bearing Tree. Drew, I'm prompting you to turn your microphone on. Thank you, JC. I'll be reading two poems for y'all today. <clears throat> the first one's titled, 10 Reasons to Sell Your Ass Online. One, I have touched many lovers and won't touch another like a burrowed tick. Refugees flee to murder months underground. Outside, cats yowl, trees blooming mate without shame. Two, Boy lovers, I made them press me to the wall, legs torso wrapped. See me off to war, I'll come, not home, not lover, not yet, doesn't call, and I don't mind if he never will. Three, I had a dream we were 16 and I'd turned fossil, buried deep, leather skinned, off flesh, my pubescent bones surrender to a virgin, self-made shame, deeper comfort than lust. Four, confined, my lips scream for blood red, smeared rouge, whore legs open to the world. I record inchoate lusts, send them to every eye, a cable, a bird, a song to carry home. Five, mama denies the sum, two sons and a daughter equals two daughters and a son. Isolate the variable, paper dolls, a boy scout's knife, my thumb sliced clean, and what's lost, nothing that lasts. Six, I masturbate to lost time, O oh, temporal phallus, I swallow nothing whole. Snuff film, the stock market careens on ivy drip, dopey veined, I sing a climax, took you long enough. Seven, this nude currency, I flood the market, long a schoolgirl's longing, my body valued and shorted and speculated upon, long for heavy hips, chest full of crying over broken things. Eight, my teen years lost in no man's land, fall one score and 10 years later, count his teeth, grave lane, red petaled laurel, pressed tin disc, artifact strewn, twin sister remains by and by. Nine, God damns fruit, Eve barefoot, locked out my body's dissociative, disorder, desperate, filly, filthy Lilith makes a dahlia of one in four dead on unemployment rolls. One, I'm afraid no one will ever love me again. One, I'm afraid no one will touch my body again. One, I'm afraid my life has ended here where memory fades. One, I'm afraid. One, I'm afraid. One, I'm afraid this feels like home. 10. After the revolution, I'll be rich in lovers, standing, pens, ink, and memories not mine. Our roles reversed, now the master of ashes. I've lived through worse, mama reminds me that after the revolution, I break the ax, fascies of good intention snapping as I cut the ribbon. I, my own thief, coquettes for eyes and nose and lips. It's okay, it'll all come out in the wash. And after the revolution, he says, come and see my broken bone trusses, a rib cage for a wall, my blood to wine. This land is yours, and I am my mother's daughter. The waves submit to her gaze and take me home. My second poem is titled Unborn. A statistic. In 2016, 30.1 out of every 100,000 veterans killed themselves. Queer veterans are twice as likely to consider, attempt, and commit suicide. A cliche, away from home and camp in summer, flower child, discover a genderless nude desire, there a shirtless blonde, freshwater lake, virginal shore, the boy's ribs and spine against muscles and skin tugged taut, cartography in which to lose oneself, 
pink suns for nipples yearning you to make tongued circles, never mind the burns, other parts outlined by freshwater bathing, other parts a mouth can take whole. He rises out of the water, but staring at the sun will make you blind, and the world holds the word faggot to your throat, and you two boys share a canopy of branches, oak laurel, twin beds of pine needles pushed together, the moon fucks open birch bow gaps and paints a forest on the boy's skin. Look at this foliage speckled face. Tell yourself he looks like a girl back home. That's what it must be, even if you never loved her. Turn away now, child, and forget his name. Another cliche. Teen boy, teen joys riding up 95, best friend in the front seat playing odes to ache. He turns the music down, begs you your thoughts. You don't know if this is love, the hands held defiant to be truck lynched kind of way, the unzipping best friend's pants kind of way, the lips wrapped around cocks kind of way and forget the taste, you'll get over it. But worst of all, the imagine a future and you two happily ever after kind of way. Tell yourself you're no fag. Let that lie take you down this road. Another 15 years till you're honest and he's gone. Muscle memory. Parents fight. Hush now, child. Father wants a home long gone. Vietnam, alternate reality where he never lost his daddy, nor the colonnaded home, nor the flag pinioned to soil, never sewn with steel like glass shattered underfoot. Rule one of Gook Holmes, take off your fucking shoes. Father never was a gardener, but he plants seeds, grow unchecked in abandoned homes. My worst fear, mama in the mirror, you like you, except the younger, prettier version whose name you can't know. They take the money, paper doesn't mix with blood like water and oil, but shitty gardeners never water, never weed, nor feed his crop, makes it through customs, these malnourished stalks, platted into a noose wrapped around ma's throat, ma, northern word for southern ma. Viet word for mother, mom, mama, ma, north, south, mother, father, paired each makes my living room a free fire zone. Mama, we are small women and they are big men. I learned to fight from helicopters down that up back in Binja. Marines starved at Khe San, the palace gates in Saigon breached, us fighting skirmishes, small arms hurled, placed, broken a dustpan over dad's head, dragged upstairs by mom's hair. First things, first paragraph of an army operations order. There's a reason the threat comes before all else. There's a reason to lace keys in your fist, make a flak vest of your teen body. There's a reason no one counts dead civilians. And I learn who the enemy is every time. A tragedy. Best friend signs a dotted line, marks a border between you and him and an army at war. Mother won't sign the papers. You are 17 and hate your country. You are 17 and want to die for it anyway and hold a knife to your stomach. Say you'll open the only door that lets you back inside. Mother remembers, refuses still, 15 years on. You tell her who you are. Not the child at her breast, not that teen boy, nor the camouflage that is every man's skin, but a woman grown like her and blooded and mama can refuse you no more. Thank you. Thank you very much for that reading. Uh, that was incredible. Um, and thank you, Isabel and Rosa and Mackenzie. Thank you everyone who tuned in today for your questions. Um, this October marks the Rails 20th anniversary. We'll be celebrating, celebrating all year long. Please consider making a contribution um, to keep the rail and our special projects free, relevant, and independent like the New Social Environment, Are We the Immigrants Project, and all else that we do. We're trying to double our participation from last year and reach 500 donors. Um, I'm gonna drop the link to that in the chat if you're so compelled. Um, and join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation on the current exhibition to Jonas with Love in honor of Jonas Mikas mm -hmm. with curators Chuck Smith and Ben Nordover and an excellent cast of artists and musicians. Um, you all now have the ability to turn your microphones on and say goodbye on your way out. Um, and thank you again.
Thanks, everyone at the rail. I, I Thanks, Mackenzie. Thanks, Isabel. Thanks, Isabel. Thanks, Isabel. Thank you, Drew. Thanks, Thanks Rosa. Emily. Rosa. Thank you, Rosa. So good to see you, Tarza, and all your cats. <laughs> Thank you, Mackenzie. <laughs> Thank you, Isabel. Thank you, Rosa. It's amazing. Gracias, Gracias,